Patrick Beja is back! Oh, good lord, I can't believe it's finally happened. <laughs> I can't Not believe bad. it's me. <laughs> uh, How's it going, Tom? It's going well. How was your vacation? It was nice. It was uh, full of nature and trees and uh, the sea and all sorts of things that I don't usually Did get to experience. Did you any dipping into fjords? I, well, not in the fjords, mm -hmm. but actually... Uh, we had a midsummer uh, evening with lots of friends, and uh, we had a bonfire in the middle of the night. Nice. And at some point, there might or might not have been a skinny dipping fiesta. Interesting. A midsummer night's a dream. It didn't last long uh, because it was freaking cold. <laughs> it was the coldest uh, June in Finland in like 20 years. All right, well, let's get this going here. Are you ready for some French to welcome you back? I was born ready for some French to welcome me back. Ceci est le show quotidiennement de la technologie. Aujourd'hui est Patrick Tuesday. Si vous voudriez soutenir DTNS, allez à patreon.com slash acedetect. I was born ready. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 7th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Very happy to have Patrick Beja back alongside after a much-deserved respite jumping into freezing waters in Finland. How's it going? I, I, uh, I'm doing super well, and uh, I've really missed all of you guys and the show and the chat room and the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm Actually, I, it's been, uh, I think, in two weeks I haven't listened to the show even, and that's really been weighing on my soul, so I'm really glad to be back in, in full action. Well, with that in mind, I'm going to go back and read all the headlines from the past two weeks for Patrick <laughs> to catch him up. Uh, no, just kidding. That's why we make them available on demand. Let's start off with today's headlines. The BBC has announced the BBC Microbit. It's a pocket-sized, codable computer. TechCrunch says the Microbit features 25 red LEDs, two programmable buttons, an onboard motion detector, accelerometer, a built-in compass, Bluetooth smart technology, five I.O. rings to connect the Microbit to devices or sensors using crocodile clips or four-millimeter banana plugs. In fact, you can plug it into an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. BBC Microbit is programmable by software on dedicated websites. So you can use a browser to uh, connect to it, microbit.co.uk, uh, and you can access that from your PC or your tablet or your mobile, which gives it some flexibility for programming. Up to a million devices will be given to every 11 or 12-year-old child in year 7 or equivalent across the United Kingdom for free. And then uh, the BBC's nonprofit organization that made the microbit will license the design to third parties for third-party manufacture. I have ambivalent feelings about this. Do you? It's, I, I actually do. It's not... So I come back. First story, I'm the uh, Grinch on the show. Sorry about this, but you it's think not like I think... the break would have softened them up, folks. <laughs> actually, apparently not. Um, so it's not like I think this is a bad thing. It's just that there's a movement currently that says, oh, kids have to learn to code and have to learn the inner wor about the inner workings of computers, and it's so important. And I'm not saying it's not the case, but... I think they would be much better served if they learned about practical things on the internet, like data privacy and how to actually use Facebook and what it means when something is on Google and how to, you know, set their uh, data, you know, how to handle their data. And sure, some of the kids that are currently being... Um, initiated to programming are probably going to be interested in that as well. But I'm not sure this is the best way to get computers in Don't you in think schools. that you would have a better understanding of those issues if you know more about how computers work, though? That's my thought here. And I know you're not saying that the micro bit is a bad idea. I know that. It's just that I don't think this is the best way of... So to, to take an analogy, it's like if people need to understand cars, uh, how, you know, to understand traffic, do you want to teach them how an engine works or do you want to teach them the traffic rules? And I yeah. think that's the... Well, okay, difference. fair enough, right? You don't need to understand how a car works to obey the traffic rules, but you might understand a lot more about traffic and how it operates and safe following distances and why you need to drive safely if you understand a little bit about how it works. I agree with you that you, it can be taken too far, right? Uh, and not everyone's going to be good at coding, and, can, and kids shouldn't be forced into learning coding 
any farther than they should be forced into learning any particular subject. But I think a little basis in, in how coding works uh, and how hardware works is sorely needed. I don't think we're to the point where we need to actually pull back and say, okay, stop forcing kids into something they're not good at or not interested in. I think the opposite. I, I think kids who are interested and are good at this aren't getting the opportunities yet. So I feel like this is the right thing to do at this point. Fair enough, but they're giving them to every single kid in that age group. And yeah. in those, you know, some of them would need it, but all of them actually of them need to on eBay, right? Facebook. Everybody wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Bloomberg reports Samsung's operating income fell 4% in Q2 to 6.9 trillion won, missing analysts' estimates. Samsung Galaxy S6 sales were disappointing, and six edge shortages could not keep up with demand. Operating profit in the consumer uh, electronics division dropped likely due to decreased demand for TV. Earnings from the semiconductors unit was about uh, was about 3.2 trillion won. So the stock actually rose on this news, which I found quite interesting. I think the idea is that while Samsung is getting squeezed from both ends on the smartphone front, both both on the cheap end and on the high end by Apple, people saw in this that the real problem was manufacturing shortages, and Samsung seems to have a credible plan to address that. Uh, semiconductor units are doing well. It looks like Apple is probably going to buy Samsung chips for the next round of iPhones, which would be a boost there. Uh, and th everyone expects the TV division's operating profits to decline, so that's no surprise. So really, it's not a great report for Samsung. I know it's the seventh straight quarterly decline, but if you're going to have a bad report, I feel like this is the right bad report to have for Samsung. <laughs> the the best worst the best bad case scenario. Yeah. The Verge reports that Microsoft is offering five hundred thousand dollar grants that come with a pair of HoloLens dev kits. They basically want to see independent groups come up with ideas for HoloLens, things like computing with data visualization, mixed reality arts in installations, teaching applications. Microsoft is going to accept submissions through the beginning of September with university and nonprofit researchers eligible for the grants and awards to be announced in October. Now, what do you think of this one? Uh, so I'm going to put a, a positive spin on it <laughs> because I'm not the biggest fan of the HoloLens either. I do think that if you want to find a use for the HoloLens, that's probably the way to go about, uh, about it. The HoloLens is something very strange that looks very, that is very seducing as an idea, as a fantasy, but uses for it are going to be very difficult to define and to nail down. So and this is a great way to address that, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. PCMag.com reports that Samsung announced two terabyte versions of its 850 EVO and 850 Pro SSDs. The new two terabyte versions use Samsung's 3D vertical man technology and have the same 7 millimeter and 2.5 inch aluminum case as their predecessors with plans to expand the lineup to include MSATA and M2 form factors in the future. The 2TB EVO is priced at $799.99, while the Pro version will set you back $999.99 and is available in 50 countries. I know that I am an outlier when I say this, but I always want the biggest freaking hard drive I can get my hands on, and I want a flash drive these days. So a two terabyte flash drive, I know this one's not available for laptops yet, but a two terabyte flash drive in my laptop, which is now coming soon, just makes me slobber a little, to be honest. I I've been using um, Samsung hard drives, the previous version, the 840 uh, Evo, for a few years, and I'm super, super happy with it. And I'm actually considering changing hard drives and getting a one terabyte version. And that seems like a big invest investment, but I'm telling you guys, anyone listening to my voice, if you don't have an SSD in your mach machine yet, this is the biggest upgrade you can put on your PC, and I would not live without it. I walk down the stairs not worrying if my hard drive's spinning anymore. It's amazing. <laughs> the New York Times reports that 13 of the world's most notable cryptographers and security specialists have released a paper that concludes there is no 
viable technical solution, in their opinion, that would allow the U.S. and British governments to gain, quote, exceptional access to encrypted communication without putting that data in danger. The authors include Whitfield Diffie of Diffie-Hellman, Ronald R. Rivest, I'm sorry, Ronald L. Rivest, the R in RSA, Harold Abelson, Peter G. Newman, Bruce Schneier, Susan Landau. Uh, this paper came out in advance of FBI Director James B. Comey Jr. and Deputy Attorney General Sally Quillian Yates testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee on the risks of new encryption technology to law enforcement and investigation. Uh, these are these are the people who invented crypt modern cryptography, uh, so I'm inclined to just not say anything except, okay, um, I think I have to listen to your opinion. If only politicians were as wise as you are, Tom. If only. If only. <laughs> uh, TechCrunch reports Yola, or Jola, the maker of Sailfish OS, will split into two companies. Yola Limited will develop and license the Sailfish OS with board chairman Dr. Antti Sarnio in charge. A future unnamed business will build devices for privacy aware co consumers and corporations, which may include multi OS devices. Former CEO Tommy Pienimaki has been appointed to a new position, quote, outside the company. Yola will make announcements about Indian partnerships at Mobile Work Congress Shanghai next week. So this is really interesting. It's, it's you know, the, the face value interpretation is Yola has decided to double down on operating system development, uh, and the hardware development seemed to be holding them back, and likewise, hardware development might have been held back if they felt like they had to use Sailfish OS for everything, so everybody wins, except no one's going to the hardware company except the former CEO, and I very wisely made you read all the Finnish names here. Uh, <laughs> I I feel like this is a little bit of a of a Maybe it's not, but it looks from the outside like they kicked a guy out who was more interested in hardware than OS and said, great, go do your hardware thing, and good luck with that. Well, you know I was in Finland for a month, so obviously I know all about this, but unfortunately I can't disclose the information I have. So. Oh, Sorry. really? Okay. <laughs> yes, of course. Did I they do. make you sign a non-disclosure agreement when you leave Finland? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> you can't say I can't. I happened. can't. You know, confirm or deny that fact. Anything that happened at a bonfire, can't talk about it. Anything happened with NOLA <laughs> at Sailfish OS, can't talk about it. TechCrunch reports that French startup Open Classrooms is launching the first state-recognized bachelor's degree in France that relies exclusively on massive open online courses, a.k.a. MOOCs. The program is in conjunction with French school IESA Multimedia, offers three learning paths, engineering, design, and digital marketing. The course takes an average of a year to complete and costs 300 euros a month, a significant discount from the 6,950 euros a year that you use to get the same degree in person at IESA Multimedia. You know, you might not think so, but France is actually very technologically savvy, and that doesn't surprise me all that much. It's, it's cool. Yeah, I think this is great. And and we have some accredited degrees coming out of MOOCs in other parts of the world. Uh, this is just the first one in France, and, and I, I like the idea of more of these happening, so that's great. TechCrunch reports Indian music service, Savn. So how do you pronounce this? Savn, Savn I guess. Savn. Uh, has raised a hundred million dollars and plans to expand into video. CEO Rishi Malho Malorta said, quote, the exciting thing about the market is that we can be part Spotify, part Pandora, and part Netflix. Savin will, <laughs> that sounds somewhat Swedish for some reason, Savin will try to succeed in taking advantage of the relationship between new albums and Bollywood films. Something rival Hungama has also been trying to attempt. Yeah, I know you didn't go to India on your vacation, so I apologize <laughs> for that one. Uh, I think this is fascinating, though, because it, it, it shows the difference in approaches to different markets. Uh, I think what Sabin is trying to do is say, look, Bollywood films come out and their albums sell like crazy. The songs that come out in conjunction with them sell like crazy. We've got to figure out how to combine these two. And they're new to the market, so they can, they can take advantage of that second mover advantage and learn from what Hungama has already attempted. Maybe they'll succeed.
The surprising thing, I think, is that actually it didn't happen sooner. From the outside, at least, we have such an image of enormous uh, weight of Bollywood, which is obviously very musical uh, in the type of movies they produce. I'm, I'm guessing, though, it might also be a um, an infrastructure issue, because, of course, if we look at things from here, things like streaming music and video is a given, but... India is only now getting to the point where they have a viable market for those. So yeah, bandwidth be penetration is certainly uneven. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So uh, time for some news from you. Uh, several of the stories we've already talked about were submitted by you, and thanks to everybody who submits stories. We we always give credit to a couple each day, but I always feel bad for the folks who submit like the most important story of the day. Obviously, the micro bit was submitted by lots of people, uh, and that really helps. So. Even if your name doesn't get read, you are certainly appreciated for participating in dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Spare Lollipop and Star Fury Zeta both pointed out a new version of OpenSSL will be released Thursday, July 9th, which all it, they've said in advance is that it will patch a high severity vulnerability. Graham Cluley on his site points out that the Heartbleed vulnerability has made folks jumpy about OpenSSL patches, which is why few details are being announced ahead of time. They don't want to tip off their hands to a lot of bad actors who are focused on OpenSSL right now. So that's in two days. Just two days, two more days to hold on. And after that, everything will be perfect. Everything will be perfectly safe until the next patch. <laughs> Streak it Rich submitted the MarketWatch story that Apple Watch sales have fallen 90% since opening week, according to market analysis firm Slice Intelligence. Apple is selling around 10 to 20,000 watches a day, compared to 200,000 a day during launch week. An estimated two-thirds of watches sold are the sports watch. Slice based its research on electronic receipts emailed to participants. This is definitely one of those stories where your opinion of Apple as a company is going to change the way you write the headline. Uh, you could say like two thirds of watches are sport watches. That's great. Uh, sales holding steady now after a, a huge spike. Or you can say it's a 90% drop. Apple Watch sales are in the toilet. Everyone's buying the cheapest one. It's horrible. It's a. It's too. It's still too early to tell. I mean, we'll we'll see these numbers bottom out and then they will rise again at the holiday season and possibly be affected by another Apple Watch announcement in the autumn. Uh, I'm not saying I know that's going to happen, but you know, there's a good chance that it'll happen. How do you, how do you see these Patrick when you when you hear these numbers? Well, again, there are two ways of of looking at it. I think my uh uh, prediction at the prediction show was that Apple Watches would see huge sale numbers in the beginning for the first couple of months and then they would end up in drawers and I actually uh, heard Veronica last week saying that she wasn't using hers all that much anymore which surprised me because she was one of the people who was very uh, uh, a, a big fan of her Apple Watch in the beginning so for, through my view, my lens, uh, it seems to mean that maybe people are wising up and understanding that this thing is completely useless. However, uh, 10 to 20,000 is not a, a meager amount. And when you compare it to 200,000 a day for the launch week, obviously the launch week is going to be where all the pent-up demand and the marketing buzz and all of this is, you know, it's the launch. Obviously, they're going to be sp uh, selling... Uh, truckloads of those. So I don't think it really means much at this stage. We'll have to see what it, what happens when they start announcing numbers. Yeah, I my sense is that the Apple Watch is not a failure, uh, that it's selling, even 10 to 20,000 is, is selling great for a wearable. I think what may have happened, though, is that Apple may not have entirely rejuvenated or relaunched a market like they did with the phone and the tablet. Uh, but even then, it's, I think it's still too early to tell for sure. Well, you know, even if you look at 10,000 a month, that's a million, uh, 10,000 a day, that's a million yeah. in, in 100 days, right? And likely they're selling more than those. So they will have sold a bunch of millions of the, that watch. It's not a failure by any, uh, any measure. And that is a look at the headlines. Now, when you talk about wearables, we almost always talk about fitness trackers and watches. And there are a few exceptions to that. One of them uh, had a Kickstarter launch on June 16th, 
And uh, there was another story about it relaunched on Reuters today. They're about halfway through their funding. It's called Doppel. Now, it looks like a wristwatch. It's round. It, you wear it on your wrist, but you wear it on the inside of the wrist. So the round part goes underneath your, your palm or by your palm rather than on the side where you would look at it normally. And it measures your resting heart rate not on the watch, on a smartphone app. And you may say, well, the, why does it do that? Here's the thing. It wants to get your resting heart rate and then calibrate a rhythm that it taps into your wrist. The idea is that, like music, a high energy rhythm that's a little faster than your heartbeat will energize you and increase your focus and increase your energy and a slower tap that's less than your resting heart rate will calm you down, will slow you down, maybe even help you go to sleep. Uh, so the, the idea here is it's a wearable meant simply to adjust your mood, Patrick. Some might even say to manipulate your mood, although you're the one manipulating it, so uh, it's it's still fine. I think it's a really interesting story, and there are really two parts of that story. First is the intriguing uh, even concept of the thing, and it brings the question, does it actually work? Um, it, they have a bunch of psychologists, and you know, it, basically they're saying, yes, we tested it, it works. Already, if it does work, it's a, a, a interesting use of technology. Um, it works in the way that it knows your heartbeat because it has a little sensor that can uh, measure it, and then you can tell it go, you know, more intense or less intense as compared to your personal heartbeat heartbeat at that moment. So if it does work, it's like they describe it like music without the uh, you know the annoying sounds or the uh, the sound that can be discomfort uh, discomfort or annoyance to your surroundings or even to yourself when you're working. As that and as you is, said, they tested it themselves, but there was one independent test by psychologists at Royal Holloway University of London with controlled tests showing the device did show improved alertness when correctly set to the user's preference. They haven't tested, and they're going to, but they haven't quite tested yet whether it provides the calming effect. So there's one independent test that says, well, at least in, in one of these cases, it works. Right. And, and I think we need, obviously, more than, you know, a couple we need to see. I think everyone will want to have tested themselves because, before they're absolutely convinced that this weird thing works. Um, but it's already a very, uh, uh, as I was saying, a very interesting use of technology. And it could be very useful if it actually has that effect. The, the other aspect of this, though, that piqued my interest was the new concept of using uh, uh, technology and wearables to, well, manipulate your, your phys not your physiology, but, your, well, your mood and, and the way you uh, feel or yeah, behave. Yeah, I guess or physiology is not a bad way of putting it because you're, you're manipulating yourself, right? You're, yeah. you're using your heart rate and, and, and trying to trick psychologically yourself into calming down or, or ramping up. And maybe in the in the future there that could be another you know area of, of research where instead of just having sensors on your wearables, you could actually have them uh, have an effect on yourself. And I, I know that there are things like uh, in the case of diabetes, you can have auto automatic pumps that will release uh, uh, you know the um, Ah. Insulin, yeah, Thank the proper you. Yes, level of medicine. Right. And, exactly. And, and there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of examples of that with medicine, for sure. But if you start thinking about it to uh, uh, in the way that you do in this case, where it would help you perform better or calm down when you have to, and maybe it doesn't have to be medicine, but it's a completely new area of research, it could become, uh, I could see it becoming something that is, well, I've, I've professed my... Uh, uh, lack of love for wearables or at least for smart smartwatches a few times and that's mainly because I don't see the need or you know the actual practical use in this case I think it's very easy to see the practical use because um, it's not about information right all of the smartwatches and Fitbits of the world are trying to just do what computers do which is handle information and I think what's cool here is that here's a wearable that says well we're definitely technology but we're not worried about the information. We're using a little bit of information to provide something to you, but we're worried about the result. We're focused on helping you be 
a more effective person. Whether you need to calm down for a presentation or whether you need to like stay awake in a meeting, they use both of those analogies in, in their videos. This is created by a material scientist, a designer, an electronic engineer, and a quantum physicist, right? So this is this is what I want to see more of, which is not just a, a startup venture capitalist and a developer come up with an app and and more ways to slice and dice information. Like this is a this is a really interesting new idea, at least for wearables. You know, I'm I'm reminded of an experiment I heard about years and years ago before wearables were a thing. Maybe you've heard of it as well. Um, it was an experiment where someone had uh, created a belt that was equipped with a compass that would and and the belt had a compass and a series of uh, motors that would vibrate to indicate uh, the north. And so he, he was trying to replicate what he what we think birds do when they navigate. Exactly, exactly. And it would vibrate constantly where the north was around his waist. And he, he mentioned that after, uh, I don't know, a certain period of time of using it, he had developed an in instinctive uh, um, understanding of, or of where the north was. And that was kind of useless at the time, but... It was, in a way, a, a, the a kind of use of a wearable device that would influence his senses. And I, I'm this, you know, I'm not necessarily super excited for this Doppel uh, uh, device that we're talking about, but the doors that this kind of thinking opens for for the future. Um, and actually, you know what? It's seventeen pound, uh, seventy pounds. It's let's say 100 bucks or 100 euros, a little bit less or more. And But that's something I really would be willing to try and see if it even works. Um, so, yeah, it's intriguing. It's Yeah, it really is. Uh, the, the, these folks who, who are doing this met on a joint course run by Imperial College London along with the Royal College of Art. Uh, and so I, I love when interdisciplinary studies also <laughs> spit out something like this. And they're doing their Kickstarter now. They're called Team Turquoise. The device is called the Doppel. As you mentioned, if you back them on Kickstarter, you can get it for 70 pounds. They'll probably be more expensive once it goes on sh sale. They want to ship it April 2016. And the all-important uh, battery life question, five to ten hours, depending on the intensity. So you only get five hours if you're constantly trying to amp yourself up. Ten Let's hours if you're chilling. I, I'm guessing this can be improved if they have some yeah. serious research in the mark too. But would you would you use this kind of you know body hacking device? Let's say the good thing here is that it's really just a taptic feed you know feedback. Right, it's so not injecting. Not invasive. Anything you. It's not medicine. It's yeah. not going to have any other side effects that we know of. Yeah, why not? Yeah. See if it works. Hmm. I, I'm. The the really fun thing becomes when you have this sort of this kind of medipack that has all sorts of chemicals that it can inject you with. <laughs> it's and, not just uh, haptic; it's like actually yeah. injecting stimulants into you. That's version exactly. three or four. Yeah, <laughs> that reminds me of of the uh, the couches on the Rosinante in James S. A. Corey's The Expanse. They always inject them with medicines to help them deal with the gravity. Uh, so yeah, I'd like that around my wrist as well. Thank you. Please make. <laughs> Uh, let's get to our pick of the day. It comes from Big Jim. He says, I'm sure some of the Android listeners most likely use Pocket Cast. So I know I do because it's probably one of the best podcast players in the Android sphere. I use Pocket Cast on Android myself. Uh, Big Jim says, did you know there's an integrated web player for this app? Let's say you want to save the battery on your phone or tablet. Go to play.pocketcast.com, log in, and there will be all your played and unplayed podcasts. Saves the spot just like the apps do. You can quickly go to it for listening to the end of that DTNS or Phileas club without touching your phone. When you're done on the computer, just go back to Pocket Cast app on your phone and it will be synced to where you left it for that portable enjoyment. Uh, so far, Big Jim says the only downside is they haven't created playlists on the web app, but I sent this as a recommendation to the team and they said it's something they're looking into. Uh, so thank you, Big Jim. Play pocketcast.com and that's the kind of feature like whisper sync on audible that makes you want to live in a mini ecosystem like that agreed and you and also yes, know when the next Phileas club is <laughs> uh, sorry yes I, I skipped one this month it's coming back at the end of the month and it will be packed we have so much to talk about send your I, picks to yeah. feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks a uh, couple of messages of the day. One from Dan Gardner, just real quickly. 
Uh, he's from San Antonio. He suggested Greece as a location for the giant robot battle that Veronica and I were talking about on Monday. He's like, why not help out our Greek friends? They could use it right now. So, I don't know. We're just throwing that out there. I don't think that would solve all of Greece's woes, but can't hurt, right? Unless they tore well, up the you know. side. Yeah, well, hopefully they don't get, you know, out of control and start... Right. Oh, they do have uh, uh, pilots, so they should be able to right. to control them. Uh, and then finally, before we go, Jenny Josephson, our producer, uh, who is here right now, re wanted to record her thoughts on the Justin Bieber butt controversy. If you haven't been following this, uh, Justin Bieber has posted a picture to Instagram of himself naked from the rear. And I'll let Jenny tell you the rest of it. Okay, people. So last night, Justin Bieber showed his bare bum in a picture on Instagram. And predictably, the internet went insane. Now, I absolutely love the jokes. I mean, come on. It's a pretty soft target. But the interesting thing is that as of today, Instagram has not censored a nude picture of Justin Bieber. As we know, Instagram recently updated its nudity policy, which reads, we know that there are times when people might want to share nude images that are artistic or creative in nature, but for a variety of reasons, we don't allow nudity on Instagram. This includes photos, videos, and some digitally created content that shows sexual intercourse genitals and, hello, close-ups of fully nude buttocks. It also includes some photos of female nipples, but photos of post postpistectomy scarring and women actively breastfeeding are allowed. Nudity and photos of painting and sculpture is okay too. Now that's a carefully thought out policy, but it makes me wonder, did a bunch of people at Instagram have a quick hallway meeting this morning and decide that this Bieber image is a mid shot or even a wide shot and so it's okay? Or did they decide that a male butt is less dangerous than a female nipple? Or did they have no meeting at all because Justin Bieber has 32.2 million followers and you don't go messing with that? Either way, this, to me, is dangerously close to being another example of a powerful technology company, one owned by Facebook, lest we forget, carefully crafting what its users are allowed to see. By declaring some nipples verboten and some okay, Instagram is quietly shaping the world that we get to see. Or, in other words, censorship. Now I know Instagram absolutely has the right to pull or not pull any particular image. They're a company and we all signed the terms of service. But censorship by one company over many people is always a bad idea. And it never works because it's always based on values that are not universally shared. Now there are images out there in the world that should be banned because they break the law. Stolen images of celebrities in the nude and child pornography are two examples that have been in the press lately. But Chelsea Handler's torso, of which she is clearly very proud, Rihanna's chest, a girl with a period stain on her clothes, a picture of Chrissy Teigen that appeared in a major fashion magazine. How about a woman celebrating her plus size figure or her hard earned stretch marks? Yes, we all have different comfort levels with nudity. And we all have different valid opinions about what we're ready to have our kids exposed to. But censorship is the easy way out. So I hope that somewhere in a conference room at Instagram today, someone is working on the tougher, more durable solution. The way to tag images as explicit, or your kids might not be ready for this, or might be upsetting, use caution. Maybe there's a non-invasive way to verify age of Instagram accounts and limit exposure based on that factor. Anyway, there's a lot more I could say on this topic and a lot more that will be said on the story in the next couple days. But I have to go now because I need to Photoshop a pair of googly eyes on Justin Bieber's bum. And I'll defend your right to do that, Jenny. Uh, yeah, I'd, here's the thing. When you have a large community like that, and you have to let an algorithm do some of the standard setting, you're always going to run into these, these kinds of issues. Google has learned that. That's why there's safe search and moderate safe search and settings like that. And these, are the, these are the growing pains that will leave stretch marks on the policy of Instagram. <laughs> I, I would have a million things to say about this. Uh, 
but the only one I will say, I think the only really interesting question in, in this whole story is, would they have let that butt stand if it was a female butt? It's, to me, it's the only question that really matters. But, but I guess we won't get the answer to this. Oh, you know, I think a, a female version of Justin Bieber, some other equally famous uh, uh, artist, should post the same kind of picture, and oh. we should see what happens. I'm pretty sure Chelsea Handler is going to be all no. over this in about two hours. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but go. Yes, just, uh, just Instagram her or Twitter, yeah. even better. Well, and, and that, Jenny, I think that's your point. No, it's, it's well made, which is Instagram can do whatever it's, it wants, but what is the smart thing for them to do? I guess that's... what is, if, they, if you really want to take the lead as a company, and I'm not saying it's easy because they made a very good point in the chat room, which is morals differ so dramatically Definitely. in different countries that, that there has to be a better way. There has to be a way to be able to select or self-select or self-police the images and just say, okay, here's your one moment, brief moment before you can click on it. Enough time for a parent to say no. I mean, it's not. Here's a, my family friendly filter. Family version friendly of filter. There, there's a lot of different ways, none of which are perfect, but just blanket algorithmic censorship is going to take those edge cases and put them right in the public's eye and cause a lot of problems. And a less controversial uh, example is we are now cross-posting this show on the Daily Tech News Show YouTube channel and my personal channel, Ace Detect, and I constantly get notices from YouTube asking me to clarify if I have the rights to repost this show that I own in both places because the algorithm can't tell it's the same person. It's just weird. Uh, well, thank you, Jenny Josephson, for that. I appreciate the editorial. And thank you, Patrick Beja, for being on the show uh, and being back. We missed you. Oh, I missed you guys. Seriously, I did. It was it was very strange not being on the show and being on, as I was saying, on holiday that I wouldn't even listen to the show. I actively stopped myself from working. And I have to say, when you work with people you uh, appreciate and doing something you love, it's uh, a... a a couple of weeks of vacation is a long time, so I had to force myself to do it, but now I'm really glad. I'm really, really glad to be back and to be able to say that, you know, I was born ready every Tuesday evening. That's fantastic. It's important to take that time so that you can recharge. You need to do that, uh, and, and it's great when you can do that and be excited to come back, so I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, you can follow Not Patrick at Twitter, and when I say follow Not Patrick, that's Patrick. He's Not Patrick on Twitter, so go to twitter.com slash Not Patrick to follow Patrick, and then you can get his English language podcast at frenchspin.com. Absolutely. Uh, thanks to our patrons. We've got 5,062 folks in there willing and able to make the show possible, make it possible to have Patrick and Scott Johnson and Veronica Belmont uh, on board, Roger Chang helping us, Jenny helping us, uh, me helping us. <laughs> like The only reason any of us are here is because of you. So thank you for your support. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support uh, to find out all the ways to support the show. One of them is to get a DTNS t-shirt. Uh, if you're going to Nerdtacular, Jenny and Sebgans created a new DTNS t-shirt. It has the DTNS logo on the front. And on the back, it says Nerdtacular, kind of in a line, and it has everybody who's involved with the show's name kind of filling in the line. Uh, so we've got, like, for instance, uh, Patrick Beja's name in there, Veronica Belmont's name in there, Scott Johnson, all with a letter from Nerdtacular to spell it out. you got to take a look at it. Go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash store, and if you're going to Nerdtacular and you want to order the shirt, use the code Two sides, T W O S I D E S, and you won't get charged for shipping. You can just pick it up in Salt Lake City at Nerdtacular. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 51259 daily. That's 512 3 Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, 4 30 p.m. Eastern at alphageekradio.com, and visit our website at dailytechnewsshow.com. We will be back tomorrow with the aforementioned Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> that t-shirt is really cool. Yeah, Jenny, uh, Jenny came up with that. the design and then Sebgon's like prettied it all up for, for print for us. It works really good. Yeah, no, yeah. it's pretty Super sweet. Cool. And it forms a T.
<laughs> for team. Tom. <laughs> oh. Of Tom course, I showed him. it to Eileen uh, last night, and the first thing she's like, where's your name? And I'm like, it's there. It's in the logo. My name's everywhere. She's like, oh. And I'm like, and it's a P. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's what everybody has said. Was, where's Tom's name? I was like, oh, God, oh. I did it. I did it. <laughs> you did fine. Uh, this is a good show. What should we call it? <laughs> Allow me to go to Showbot. Um, once micro bitten, twice schooled. Mm. Once micro colon bitten, twice schooled. I don't know. Eh. Um, I get where they're. I get where you're going, Dark Redeemer. Yeah. Uh, Samsung's on the edge. K coding for kids with a K. Uh, uh, for button. For button. <laughs> I like that one. I'm voting for that one because it's funny. <laughs> Instagram, our new robot overlord. Bieber is an arse. Buttergate. Not Patrick's back. Uh, Best bad case scenario I, I like. Verbutton is, is very cool, though. <laughs> um, what happens in Finland stays in Finland. <laughs> uh, mood watch. Um, let's see. Instagram's Justin Bieber policy and butt gazi. <laughs> wow. I know. I, I had a feeling. Uh, yeah. I mean, you throw Justin Bieber and butt in an story. You're going to get some titles. You're going to get titles. It's like a title machine. Yeah. Oh, boy. It's a self generating title situation. Yeah. It's, it's the ingredients. Um. Be safe, chip your kids. Yeah, I kind of like that. Whoa, Godzilla. It's a Patrickzilla. <laughs> Wait, is that a lion my, on your shirt? I lowered my desk. Oh, it's the Alliance lion from Ugh. Warcraft. I uh, think what you wear is that. yay, Tom. <laughs> For the Alliance. <laughs> I don't understand what any of you are saying. <laughs> it's Warcraft stuff. I know. Is this just one of those just things? in your head here, Warcraft, Warcraft, Warcraft. Warcraft. I'm just going to have to accept there are things that I'm missing out on. Major things. Let me tell you well, this. You when don't I have used to, to feel that way. Playing. Veronica would play war talk about Warcraft stuff, and I would feel that way. And then I started playing Warcraft, and all of a sudden it all made sense to me, and I was kind of disappointed. <laughs> Because it was just normal stuff. Like essentially, what we're saying is like, "Hey, your shirt says one team, and I'm on the other team. I don't like your shirt. Like, there's no secret mystery, really." I mean, you know, you're missing out on a lot of stuff, Jenny. You're missing out on noodling. Mm -hmm. You're missing out on hang gliding. You, you know, there's a lot of things. But you know what? Not everyone can experience all those things. That's true. And that's why yeah. there's blogs. I've just accepted that the AEI Guild is there to represent for World of Warcraft, and that's amazing, and I don't have to do it now. Thank you. You're saying AIE is the World of Warcraft guild, so you don't have to? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will represent for fine dining in Los Angeles. How about that? Whoa. Honking on the, on the street there. Uh-oh. <laughs> that rarely happens. It's, it's not a no honking street. Maybe at five, but uh, so we're going with Verbutton then, I guess. <laughs> you don't like that one. You don't like no, that one. No, it's fine. It's best bad case topic. scenario is, is really good. The best bad case scenario. I think the main topic like should always yeah. win. Best bad case scenario. Yeah. Are we going best bad case scenario? I've already. I don't know. That's why what, what I'm lobbying for. How how do people actually lobby? Like, should I say, hey, I can? Well, be... you'd have to come into my lobby and then wait okay. for an appointment. <laughs> wait for me to walk out, and then you. I think you wave papers in my face. Is that is that not or, right? Or cash money. <laughs> well, paper, <laughs> paper money. Oh, because I was going to do it like this virtually through the internet. See, if we had some kind of Hololens device, maybe we could use it for that. Sure. Are you coming out for BlizzCon? Uh, probably not for BlizzCon. Uh, no. But Nerdtacular. I thought 
Yeah, Nutacular. Of course, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Right. I mean, well, then I'll know, bring your maybe... stabilizer with me to Nerdtacular. Cool. <laughs> I'm permanently <laughs> scarred by the fact that the first time I met Patrick Beja in person, I was out looking for a toothbrush with horrible morning breath, and it was like <laughs> he was like Jenny, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he's French. I would, it felt terrible. Aww. We don't. It's fine. We don't. We don't bathe. We don't brush our teeth. I would food, never so. resort to stereotyping. They just swim in champagne and they're done. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, uh, to meet you. So, Patrick, have you heard about Fabien Sarrier's uh, new scarf? Oh, Fabien wait, is a hacker and machine knitting enthusiast running a Kickstarter for a scarf. Uh, that is pr provable, uses a provably unique model off of cellular automatons and is made of merino wool. That I need to have that checked by my scarf department immediately. $150 Please. gets you a custom scarf. It's called Knit Yak. Custom Mathematical Knit Scarves. Mm. Here, I'm going to put it in the chat room and I will put it in the, uh, in the Slack as well. Yeah, you, okay. you need to look this over. I'm not sure I approve. Okay. See, that's why I wanted to, you as our resident scarf expert needed mm -hmm. to assess this. I will I will uh, look into it and report back. I'm very worried right now. I'm concerned. I mean, grease is one thing, but, you know, <laughs> scarves are a serious business. I don't know. Mathematical knit scarves? That, that, I would think that would be a positive, no? I mean, I don't know I, about scarves, though. So. I don't. I don't succumb to hype, Tom. I need to uh, perform a thorough investigation of the uh, technology, and it's not all about whiz bang, uh, 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 you know, computer things here in the old continent. And hipster merino wool, right? Yeah. Exactly. We have to make sure that some things are preserved and some uh, traditions are observed. You can't have anyone just go out and call themselves a scarf maker and use some kind of well, automatic isn't process. That why it be a union regulating the making of scarves? <laughs> I was gonna say, isn't that why the French aided the United States in the Revolution was for our right to make scarves independent of the British king? Well, hmm. No, it was question. so they could gift us the Statue of Liberty like a hundred years later. <laughs> And you don't see the Statue of Liberty wearing a scarf, do you? No, it's a toga. We were just working the favor trajectory to get a present. <laughs> sure, we'll help you with our. Rev we'll let you help with our revolution if you give us a statue. <laughs> Fine, we'll get it to you. Oh, that'd be great if you could actually do that. Like a, like a. I've always wanted to do a show where it's just BS history. And you make up these outlandish <laughs> stories of what these things occurred. I've always wanted to do that too. I started a blog like that once just for kicks. We need to do it. Three post in. No more talk. Do it. Do we could call it softcore history. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you should do uh, uh, East meets West uh, specials about that. I know a post show where you could do that. Right. <laughs> right. We could just do it right. right we there. have a show. You know about the Cincinnati Reds, right? They were started what? by the communists. <gasps> what? Yep. True story. The what? Sorry. They were started by the communists, obviously. Wait, what was? What was? The Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Reds baseball Reds. team. Oh, right, right. They used I, to I pay all the players exactly the same. <laughs> all the stars. Actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been watching uh, the Americans. Have you mm -hmm. watched that yes. show? I've you watched know, like a handful of episodes. We've watched most of it. I think we're behind. Quite a bit, but we watched we well, watched the first and second season, but I think the third season's almost done, right? Uh, I only have the first two seasons on Netflix, okay. and I'm so halfway right. through the the first one. Um, but yeah, I I think that could you know in that context it could absolutely be that the uh, you know the Cincinnati Reds were exactly what they are called. Uh, the the best place to hide is in plain sight, and uh, I think that might have been what's been happening there. 
you know, know the Cincinnati Reds, this part isn't actually fake. Uh, the Cincinnati Reds changed their name in the 50s to the Red Legs. Red Legs? So I... Yeah, so that they wouldn't sound like they were communist. Hmm. Well, I, I had a hat. Which we all know better. Right. Uh, I had a hat growing up that said Cincinnati Red Legs on it. And I was just like, what? they're the Cincinnati Reds. You know, this is 1975, right? They were definitely the Reds. I was like, why does it say Red Legs? Hmm. And my parents wouldn't answer. And then finally my grandparents were like, oh, so they wouldn't sound like commies. I'm like, but they don't sound like why wouldn't your Why wouldn't your parents answer? I don't know. I guess they were just like, they didn't want to explain about I don't have to talk about censorship and, my grandpa, and how babies are born. And... Yeah, my grandpa <laughs> was very famously like, I'll say anything. So It, it could have been because they were sympathizers and they didn't want to like... <laughs> ah. I'm pretty sure not. Maybe my mom, but yeah. definitely not my dad. I still think McCarthy was a, was a plant. I don't actually think he was... He was a human. He was not a plant. <laughs> he was a plant by That's the Soviet so Union. Bad. He was their Manchurian candidate. I'm auditioning to take Jeff Kanata's place doing dad jokes. That's what that was about. They could do a second Manchurian candidate movie and do the subheading Manchurian candidate 2 take out. <laughs> what? Get it? Because it's Chinese. Oh. Oh. You can't make that joke. <laughs> I can. Oh. That's what's great. Minority privilege deal. <laughs> I'm into it. <laughs> All right. So, um, are, are you going with? Uh, sorry, I mean, you're going with bad, bad, no, best bad case scenario. Best bad case scenario. Yes, that is the yeah. winner. When well, there's no winner. Pointing to call it bad case. Proving once again that we pay no attention to how many votes you cast. That only just helps us narrow down our choices. Uh, that it. was the second one. I think that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it helps. More votes, the better. Um, but you know, if you if you were trying to like, I don't know, if you're trying to allege democracy in the titles, it's not. What are we, Greece? <laughs> we're gonna take this title back to the people. I have, have another movie idea. So tying in Greece. So remember back in the '80s, they did a movie called Americathon. And the whole idea was John Ritter was the U.S. president, and he started this huge telethon to get the U.S. out of debt. And so we could do the same thing for Greece, except they do like a uh, 24-7 Greece revival where they just do the whole movie over and over again. On what if the money. UK just gives back all the Parthenon freezes and says, now we're even? Mm. You just can't give stuff to people. They wouldn't appreciate it, Tom. Oh, wait. No, that doesn't work. Well, here's what we do. The UK says, we're going to keep the Parthenon freezes, but we're going to pay you for them the exact amount of debt you have. Yeah, that actually is a good idea. They should just start up a snow cone chain with the freezes. Call it the That's Parthenon a dad freezes. That's joke right there. I ah, you, just, you just won the dad joke crown away from I'm me. sorry. I'm a dad. And he's an actual dad, so that helps. All right. Well, that's it for this uh, episode. I am out of the post. Uh, Nine Attack coming up later on most of these locally owned, independently owned, AMCO transmission sponsored Diamond Club TVs.